This chapter 4 introduces mandatory convertibles and explains how their structure and pricing differ from a regular convertible. It also reviews the attractions and risks of mandatory convertibles for both issuer and investor. We warn you that most mandatory convertibles require quite some effort to master. A term sheet once again appears now in front of you and you are invited as before to identify three important differences from the previous instruments we have analyzed. Click pause while you search for these three differences. Hopefully you have identified the following differences. Number one, the instrument never even begins life as a debt instrument but rather as preferred stock. Upon conversion it changes from one type of equity to another, not from debt into equity. By extension, it does not pay a coupon prior to conversion, but rather a dividend, which is under the law more discretionary in nature. Difference number two, conversion is automatic and not at either party's option. In five years exactly, the holders of the preferred shares tender their shares and receive in exchange from the company common stock whether the price has risen, fallen or remained the same. Neither party can walk away from this conversion feature, hence the name mandatory. We should make clear however that we are describing here only one version of a large universe of instruments generically labeled mandatory convertibles. Their specifics differ significantly from case to case but they share in common the certainty that conversion will occur at some point in the future. Difference number three finally the number of shares delivered upon conversion is not fixed in advance in all cases but depends to some degree on the spot price of the common shares at maturity. If this price is at or below $48 exactly 25 shares will be delivered. But if the price is above $48, then it is the dollar value of shares that are delivered that is fixed at $1,200 to be specific. Decomposing this instrument into simpler building blocks is not as easy as in the pre preceding examples. So this time we will work backward and begin by plotting a table and graph for the IRR under a wide range of price scenarios in the hope of identifying from the shape of this graph what may lie behind it. This worksheet mandatory IRR follows largely the approach of the previous worksheet, IRR, and begins once again in column F with a listing of all spot prices at maturity from 20 to 90 down here, and to the right of this we have calculated pretty much as before the IRR that corresponds to each final stock price using once again the rate operator. 
Note carefully the formula for the entries in column G, which we just opened for you, in which the final payment at maturity is programmed to be either 25 shares, so 25 times the spot value of the shares on that final day, or 1,200, whichever is lower, i.e. the 1,200 acts as a cap, exactly as we know. This reflects correctly, just to emphasize again, the clause in the term sheet which provides for normally the delivery at maturity of 25 shares, whatever they may be worth, except when the price per share exceeds 48, in which case we start reducing the number of shares delivered in order to ensure a constant total value for those shares, a fixed total value of this 1200 highlighted here. This particular characteristic is what truly distinguishes this kind of convertible from earlier structures and we'll take a minute or two to elucidate but before we do that please note immediately to the right of the table as usual we have plotted the IRR graph against the final stock price and the cap feature is extremely well visible in the graph of course the similarity of the graph you just saw to the one for the reverse convertible is perhaps a little misleading it makes most people assume that the investor is short a put on ABC common shares just as with the reverse convertible this could be one way of looking at this instrument but due to the well-established relationship between puts calls and forwards known as the put call parity principle discussed extensively in earlier modules it turns out to be more user-friendly to visualize this instrument as a covered call i.e. as the purchase by the investor of ABC common shares and the simultaneous sale back to company ABC of a call option against those shares. The sale of this call is what places a cap on the final payoff to the investor and hence on the IRR as well. The sale of this call is also what earns the investor a premium from company ABC which is not paid up front but rather in the form of an annual cash flow during the five-year period prior to conversion and specifically paid as part of the dividend of 775 the size of this cash flow is very approximately 5.75% per annum for five years i.e. the difference between the 775 dividend received by the investor under the preferred shares prior to conversion and the 2% dividend rate he would have received during those five years had he simply purchased common stock up front with his $1,000. Put yet another way, the investor is purchasing 25 shares of common stock on day one when the price is $40 per share. Then selling a five-year European call struck at $48 on those 25 shares and finally having the premium earned from the sale of this call amortized over the first five years in the form of an additional dividend of fifty seven dollars and fifty cents ignore just for a moment the remaining puzzle why 
if the investor has sold a call on all 25 of his shares and the call expires in the money, how come the investor is left with any common shares at all after five years? And focus for now, please, solely on the economics of the situation instead. We will illustrate the previous explanation with a diagram and a flowchart that should make everything clear. Here we see the investor first handing over $1,000 to company ABC and receiving in return 25 shares of common stock. Since these shares pay currently an annual dividend of $20 in aggregate and ignoring for now the likelihood of dividend rate changes over the next five years we can replace in our diagram the stock certificates with this stream of cash flows appearing now in which we show the dividends for only the first five years in the interest of space but also make clear that at the end of those five years the investor is still the owner of 25 shares we next show the investor selling the five-year European call option on the shares back to company ABC and we know that we have priced using our pricing model these calls to be worth just about two hundred and twenty five dollars up front this premium however is now converted into an annuity from ABC to the investor of $57.50 per annum which when added to the common stock dividend of $20 right above the $57.50 brings the total cash flow to $77.50 annually we have successfully generated the cash flows for the first five years described in the term sheet and turn now to the conversion clause of course if ABC common stock is still below $48 per share the call expires worthless and the investor is left with the 25 shares he bought up front consistent with what the term sheet says when the price is above $48 and the call is exercised we need to proceed more carefully if the call had been an ordinary call with full delivery of underlying shares against cash then the investor would at expiration of this call deliver all 25 of his shares and receive in return $1,200 in cash i.e. the strike of $48 multiplied by the 25 shares in the present instance however the call is settled via what is known as net share settlement that is to say the cash payment due from ABC of $1,200 is itself paid with shares the purpose of this clause is discussed in the next chapter in detail but its effect is unmistakable it leaves the investor holding not cash but rather shares and the exact number of those shares is a variable that depends specifically on the spot price at that time and is that number whose aggregate value at that price is exactly twelve hundred dollars as a final matter and for reasons we will not discuss 
the legal form of the instrument issued initially by ABC to the investor, including the additional dividends of $57.50, is chosen to be that of preferred shares rather than common shares. All this fits exactly our term sheet and completes our explanation of the core economics of the mandatory convertible. We quickly mention a number of small inaccuracies in our model, but whose impact, even in aggregate, is not significant. First, an investor who buys common shares and sells European calls against them would benefit from any increases in the size of the dividend over the five years prior to expiration of the call. While under our mandatory instrument, the dividend rate is fixed for all five years. The impact of this difference, however, is small. A $2 initial dividend rate growing, say, at 7% per annum would reach a size of $2.72 by year five and the PV of these five years of growing dividends would be around $1.25 higher than that of a constant stream of $2 for five years. So this particular inaccuracy grosses up to some 1% upfront only under the assumptions we just stated. Second, and conversely, the dividend rate on preferred shares, while not absolutely guaranteed to be paid under all circumstances, is less likely to be reduced in difficult times than under common stock. The exact rights to reduce or suspend dividends under different forms of preferred stock vary from deal to deal, but are typically more restricted than the entirely discretionary right to do so under common stock. Third, preferred stock is senior to common stock under the corporate and bankruptcy law, so the holders achieve typically a higher recovery value in bankruptcy or an outright liquidation. More elaborate pricing models can handle each of these subtleties and achieve more precise pricing for the mandatory, but are outside the scope of this module. This worksheet, Mandatory Pricing, confirms the accuracy of this approach given what you saw in the term sheet. So, cell H6, as before, prices a call option struck at 48, of course. Cell E20 multiplies this by 25, as you can see here. Since we said that the investor is selling calls on all 25 shares that he bought per $1,000 of PREF, and cell E18 right above calculates the PV of the annuity of 5.75% of additional dividends paid for five years to the investor in exchange for the sale of the call. And we observe that the values in these two cells here, E18 and E20, are very nearly exactly the same. One important subtlety that you may have observed when we opened the formula for the PV of the dividend stream is our use of a higher discount rate here than the senior unsecured 7%. Adding together C7, C8, and C9 means adding together the risk-free rate C7 
and the senior unsecured credit spread C8 but also C9 which is a credit spread differential as you can see between preferred and senior of 175 basis points at different times of course this differential between preferred and senior may be larger or smaller and sometimes quite substantially so so what drives issuers and investors to this mandatory version of a convertible again we leave until the next chapter the accounting regulatory and ratings aspects of the analysis and concentrate only on the financial here for investors the financial perspective is largely the same as that behind a covered call the investor is reasonably bullish on ABC common stock but perhaps not too much he keeps the first 20 percent of price gains over the next five years i.e. gains from forty dollars to forty eight dollars in spot but gives up anything above that he also supplements his dividend yield from two percent to seven seventy five percent annually giving him a maximum potential IRR as we saw of ten point ninety six percent while this may seem unexciting compared to the long-term average return of around 10 to 11 percent from owning the S&P 500 it is an IRR that the investor achieves if the stock rises merely by 20 percent over five years i.e. by the very modest compounded annual rate of 3.71 percent it should be clear that like the convert uh, the reverse convertible and unlike the regular convertible this version of mandatory convertible has no direct downside protection since the investor receives 25 common shares on the conversion date even if these are worth zero at that time the only cushion against a catastrophe like this comes in the form of the high dividend rate for as long as the issuer is able to pay this and the better recovery prospects of preferred versus common stock if bankruptcy is announced prior to the conversion date For the issuer, the instrument permits, of course, an immediate equity injection that may prove less dilutive than common stock, especially when the issuer is quite bullish on his own prospects and anticipates a sizable increase in his share price prior to conversion. In our specific example here, the issuer would have had to issue 25 shares to raise $1,000. Whereas, if we assume the spot price doubles to 80, for example, over the next five years, which is equivalent to growing at an ambitious but not impossible 15% compounded annually growth rate, the investor ends up, the issuer ends up, beg your pardon, issuing only 15 shares, i.e. 1,200 divided by 80, and of course even fewer shares if they rise further. Frequently, issuers of this version of mandatory are led by a management team that feels it has turned the company around after a tough period accompanied by significant share price decline but that the market perhaps does not yet recognize this 
and so has not yet reflected the turnaround in the spot price of the stock. If management is proven right, the issuer ends up with a more limited dilution while the investor still achieves a very respectable 10.96% IRR. This more or less completes our discussion of reverse convertibles, exchangeables, and mandatories. But before we proceed to the next chapter, we show here on this worksheet IRR comparison the integration of all the data and results into one from all the alternatives we have examined so far as well as for simple common stock to illustrate further the differences between them and help you reflect on them. In all cases we assume the coupon or dividend as the case may be is paid in full for the entire five-year period of the investment. So no defaults, no deferrals, no reductions of dividend, nothing like that. And so as you can see first here in column D, the data from before is repeated for all the instruments combined. And then we have the final stock price in column F ranging as before from 20 to at the bottom of the table 90 here in row 41 and then we show sequentially the common stock the IRRs for the common stock the regular convertible the reverse convertible and the mandatory convertible but most importantly a graph then summarizes all these in one single diagram which we will now summarize. So in the light blue we have the common stock whose IRR on the right is rising potentially with no limit. For example here it reaches 18 percent as the stock price rises further and further but of course it also falls and becomes negative as the stock price declines. Here we see an IRR of negative 587 for a final stock price of 26. In Burgundy, we see the regular convertible, which benefits from, on the left, the 3% minimum IRR equal to its coupon rate, and yet on the right is able to participate in higher stock prices, again with no limit, but to a lesser degree than common stock and this is seen in two ways. First the fact that this burgundy line diagonal here always lies underneath the common stocks blue line really representing the fact that you only start benefiting from price increases above 50 with a convertible whereas with common stock you're long from 40 onwards. And the other point is related, but you're only long two stocks with the convertible versus two and a half if you put all your money in common shares from day one. So in essence the trade-off here of course is that the price for downside protection is a lower upside participation when the market is a bull market. In the third color, the green, we see the reverse convertible. Capped of course at 10% the horizontal and yet exposed to some downside risk particularly if the share price declines causing the issuer to rationally exercise his right to deliver at maturity not cash equal to the face value but rather devalued common shares. Here we see the IRR dropping to 611 and then even to 237 and indeed if we stretch the graph further to the left we would get to negative IRRs even despite a 10% coupon. And lastly, but very importantly, in black we have the mandatory convertible 
once again capped at a slightly higher IRR than the reverse convertible, specifically at an IRR over here of about 1096 and also exposed to stock price declines and negative IRRs. Indeed, one scenario here of negative 283 is visible even on this graph. One final remark is important. We have truncated all our graphs on the left, as you can see, at a price of $20 for ABC common shares, essentially to keep the size of the graphs manageable. But if we did choose to extend these graphs further to the left, and if we reached there for prices for the common stock close to zero, we really would have to make some corrections for at least some of these graphs in terms of the formula giving rise to the graph because at prices like these you know prices like two dollars a share for the common stock the company would be obviously very distressed so distressed that even the repayment of debt would be in doubt so that the regular convertible cannot really at that point be presumed to be redeemed at par even though contractually that's what's supposed to happen. Better would be to reflect the recovery value of the instrument assuming a bankruptcy or a near bankruptcy. The graph appearing now from the next worksheet labeled IRR comparison low prices illustrates this where we have stretched further to the left until two dollars per share common stock and where we see the convertible itself in burgundy see its IRR begin to decline and eventually become negative well below the previous minimum three percent that we showed in the previous graph now exactly how this phenomenon happens of course will differ case to case but what we did here was in the formula for the regular convertible IRR appearing now we've introduced as you can see towards the end of the formula an additional part the min part that essentially says as you can see assume for prices below ten dollars a share you'll understand why in just a moment that the redemption value for the convertible can be as low as fifty a number you see directly in the formula there which is roughly the average recovery value historically of senior unsecured debt according to Moody's and SMP plus somewhat arbitrarily we added five times the final stock price so obviously the lower the stock price is gone the smaller this extra item and at a stock price of zero this formula would give you exactly 50 instead of 100 as your recovery value then if the stock is two this formula visibly generates a recovery of 60 at 4 this becomes 70 but at 10 and above you're back at 100 as your recovery value on this instrument